Today, we're talking about the true history around the Osage people and the controversy around the killers of the Flower Moon, a deadly super fog caused a 150 vehicle pileup in Louisiana, Amazon listing its own driver's pee for sale on its website, this disturbing hit and run by these two teens, and breaking down what we're learning from Hamas releasing hostages. We're talking about all that and so much more on today's extra large Philip DeFranco show. You daily dive into the news, so just make sure you subscribe, you hit that like button, let's jump into it. Starting with, I don't know how many times I have to say this, if you are going to commit a crime, do not film it. And in this specific situation, if you're going to commit a felony, especially don't film yourself while you're laughing like a psychopath. Otherwise, you're going to end up like these two teens aged 16 and 18 who went on a nearly hour-long hit-and-run spree with three different stolen cars. Right, so this takes place in Las Vegas, where they allegedly hit a 72-year-old man who was on a bicycle while saying to each other, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Next, you hear one of the teens say pit maneuver him before ramming a Toyota Corolla, then driving away. And shortly after that, they yell, hit his ass, and laugh before running over a cyclist, this time killing him. And that victim being a retired police chief and the video of his death going viral on social media. And to make this all more disturbing, one of the teens can even be heard in the back of a cop car joking about the whole thing after he was arrested, asking the cop how long he'd be detained for and even asking him to go get him some food. At one point, one of the teens asks, is it really that serious? To which the cop replies, yeah, it is. Adding that he'll probably get a 20 or a 30 year sentence. To which the teen responds, you think this juvenile shit is gonna do something? I'll be out in 30 days, I'll bet you. And add it. Just a f***ing uh, idiot, bro. Slap on the wrist. And so for now, we wait for this trial to see which of them's right. But hopefully these disgusting monsters do not see the light of day for many, 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 many years. And then, over the past few days, a handful of hostages have actually been released from Hamas and some are speaking out now. For example, yesterday, two elderly women were released, though their husbands still remain among the roughly 200 hostages still being held. According to BBC News, one couple, the Lifshitz, are known peace activists. And footage has actually gone viral of the wife, Yocheved Lifshitz's release, where she appears to shake the hands of one of her captors while saying shalom, which means peace. But she also shared the harrowing experience with reporters saying, that she went through hell, that during the initial attack, people's homes were swarmed, some were beaten, and that they didn't care if someone was young or old. With her daughter also translating and explaining some of what she endured. My mom is saying that she was taken on the back of a motorbike with her body, uh, with her legs on one side and her head on another side. That she was taken through the plowed fields with a man in front on one side and a man behind her. And that while she was do being taken, she was hit by uh, sticks. By they then had to walk a few kilometers before being taken into a big network of tunnels and she and some of the hostages were taken into a room, adding that once there, the captives she saw were treated relatively well in clean facilities with medical care. But also her husband is still being held captive. She is incentive to speak positively about her captors and the situation, which is why this is just not over for her and her family, with her daughter going on CNN to say. This is not over, you know? My mom is one ray of light and my son is going berserk and everybody are happy for us. But I'm waiting to also be happy for them. Right, and this family isn't the only one to speak out, to put emphasis on the hostages still remaining. You also had the cousins of two U.S. hostages who were released on Friday telling ABC News that this is still ongoing. Getting Judith and Natalie back was not the end. It's the beginning. You feel lucky and guilty. Yeah. There are so many others. We don't know why them. So it's, for me, lucky and guilty. And there's also been a lot of emphasis on the hostages that are still being held. And actually among that, you had hundreds of celebrities signing a letter to Joe Biden, both thanking him for his leadership and calling for their release. And I mean, there was just a whole slew of people signing this. The likes of Gal Gadot, Casey Neistat, Chris Rock, Will Ferrell, Adam Sandler, Jordan Peele, the list goes on and on. With them telling Biden that they are heartened by the recent release of four hostages, but adding our relief is tempered by our overwhelming concern that 220 innocent people, including 30 children, remain captive by terrorists threatened with torture and death saying thank you for your unshakable moral conviction, leadership, and support for the Jewish people who have been terrorized by Hamas since the group's founding over 35 years ago, and for the Palestinians who have also been terrorized, oppressed, and victimized by Hamas for the last 17 years that the group has been governing Gaza. And going on to say, we all want the same thing, freedom for Israelis and Palestinians to live side by side in peace, freedom from the brutal violence spread by Hamas, and most urgently in this moment, freedom for the hostages. We urge everyone to not rest until all hostages are released. No hostage can be left behind. And then listing off dozens Dozens of nationalities saying people of all those backgrounds need to be taken home. And while we've seen support with this, this letter has also been criticized for a handful of reasons. Some saying it's Zionist, some comparing it to that COVID Imagine video. Many saying this is just a display of useless celebrity activism that a letter to Joe Biden does nothing. People writing, do they think Joe Biden has the hostages? Do they think Biden didn't know? Like he's checking his weekly Goop newsletter and is like, holy shit. Others adding it's so sad and painful that rich, famous celebrities will be rewarded for a nonsensical letter to Biden about releasing Hamas hostages, something he has no control over. Well, reasonable 
several people asking our government to pressure Israel to stop a genocide or being punished. So I'm also noting that this letter has many more signatures on the celebrity-backed letter calling for a ceasefire. But with all that, I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? Do any of those criticisms ring true to you? Or no, you disagree? Any and all thoughts, I'd love to hear from you. And then? So you probably know by now that Amazon delivery drivers frequently pee in bottles because the company's insane targets leave them with no time for bathroom breaks. But when Vice reporter Uba Butler interviewed workers at a warehouse in Glendale, California, he discovered that they also get penalized if they're caught with those bottles. With a dispatch manager explaining. You go off like a point system, so it's like if you pee in a bottle and you leave it, and like you're gonna get a point for that. How many points until they might have trouble? Well, everybody has like their own system. So our point is 10 point system. So, so instead of keeping them in their cars, the drivers just toss the bottles onto the side of the road so they don't get in trouble. Which is why and how Butler found dozens of these things littering drivers routes to and from warehouses around the world during a new documentary, The Great Amazon Heist. With him saying in Italy, Spain, the UK, and certain parts of the United States, it's the same story. Amazon is flooding the Western world with piss bottles. And adding, clearly Amazon don't care about their workers' bladders. But you know what they do care about? products and their platform. So what he does in this situation is he collects as many piss bottles as possible and then he thinks of a product that sells both quickly and without scrutiny. What better fits that description than the high caffeine energy drinks backed by internet stars like KSI and Logan Paul? So Butler markets these bottles full of nothing but human waste as release energy, giving it the tagline, the world's first fully reusable energy drink. Once you're done with its contents, simply fill it back up to the brim and start again. He then lists it on Amazon for sale in the refillable pump dispenser category and it goes live. But then, as Butler explains, something happens that I don't expect. Spec. Amazon's algorithm automatically moves the product into the energy drinks category, bypassing the entire platform's protections around food and drinks licensing. So next, you reportedly emails different Amazon departments for months trying to get release energy moved to the bitter lemon drinks category, but none budge. So he reaches out to Amazon UK's executive team with the same request, and voila, it's accepted. Now, to be clear, none of this is subtle. The drink is very clearly marketed as the urine of Amazon delivery drivers. We're only on step two. Step three is to cheat the algorithm. To do that, Butler gets everyone he knows to buy up as many bottles as possible in a short time as possible. And they leave reviews with titles like Gee Whiz and Wetting Myself with Excitement, with a man after around 80 sales being surprised to find actual real customers buying this drink. But very notably, he cancels those orders because he's not actually wanting to send actual bottles of pee to them. But then finally, Butler's hard work pays off because occupying the number one spot on the bestseller list for bitter lemon drinks on Amazon is Release Energy, or in other words, their own driver's excrement. Now, of course, the drink was promptly removed as soon as someone realized what was happening, but the fact that it was actually up long enough for people to actually buy it is humiliating, not just because of the drink's content, but also because it exposes a glaring blind spot in the company's marketplace safeguards, and that the human cost to pretty much any aspect of their business is secondary. And then, if you had to drive down I-55 through Louisiana yesterday, you had a crazier day than expected. And that's because smoke from multiple marsh fires mixed with already dense fog produced what the National Weather Service called a super fog, with the visibility at times nearing zero. So when one vehicle stopped, the one behind it would rear end it, then the one behind that would do the same, and so on and so forth, and you get this metal centipede. With one woman who avoided crashing into the car in front of hers saying the ones behind her just kept slamming into hers and then describing it was boom, boom. All you kept hearing was crashing for at least 30 minutes. One pickup truck even slammed into a Ford F-150 so hard that the Ford ended up on top of it. Also, another vehicle was driven off the road into the water, but luckily the driver was reportedly rescued. We also had reports that 18 tractor trailers all crash into one another. And all of this together adding up to an 11 mile long, 158 car pileup that killed at least seven people and sent over 25 to the hospital. And then to make matters worse, some vehicles caught fire, including a tanker truck carrying what police called a hazardous liquid. And then, because the roadway was elevated, fire trucks had to pull up alongside it and extend their ladders up to the blaze from the marsh. Now, as for the survivors, many had to abandon their mangled vehicles or were stranded for hours while first responders came in on foot to help anyone trapped inside vehicles, with then eventually school buses being brought in to transport them. But also, a big thing here is as shocking and crazy as all of this was, super fogs are not actually unusual for Louisiana. Where the state gets about two of them per year, and a key thing is it'll probably happen more frequently as climate change makes the marshes drier, which leads to wildfires. And then, the holiday festivities are on the rise. And I do believe that everything in moderation is healthy. So I plan on enjoying the deliciousness of this season, but also with the confidence of staying on track with my workouts, thanks to today's sponsor, Copilot. Because you know, you're in constant contact with your coach through messaging or calls, which is partly why I have the confidence I do to stay on track. You know, life is life. I'm sure that my schedule is going to need some tweaks here and there, but that's also why I love Copilot. Between the app and my coach, I feel supported, but also I have the flexibility and it helps me get to my goals. No matter what, even through the app, I always feel supported, not alone. And the first step super easy. They just start with an onboarding call. You connect to a coach and then they make customized workouts tailored to your needs. So if you want to join me on a fitness journey of your own, 
click my co-pilot link or scan the QR code to get a 14 day free trial with your own personal trainer. Cause y'all, the changes that you make today can enhance your life in ways you never really thought possible. So seize your moment. With a guiding hand like co-pilot, your success has never been more attainable. And I feel like I'm also proof of that cause. While there's no end goal for me in this, a lot of y'all remember where I started my journey and this is where I'm at right now. And then, you know, NIL deals have drastically changed the landscape of college sports, but we're now also seeing the same movements within high school sports. Right, and for those unfamiliar, two years ago, the NCAA declared that college students were allowed to profit from their name name, image, and likeness, NIL deals. And from that, we've seen some massive stars making bank, like Libby Dunn, a gymnast at LSU with a massive following on TikTok, making Forbes' top 50 creators list with over $2 million in earnings. And now we're seeing states across the country passing legislation to allow high school athletes to profit from NIL contracts as well. And here, it kicked off in California, passing the first law shortly after the NCAA gave the okay for college athletes. And the latest state that we've seen movement from is Michigan, with their House of Representatives just passing a bill legalizing the agreements with a 66 to 43 vote. And the representative who introduced the bill, Jimmy Wilson Jr., saying it will likely only apply to very few athletes. And adding, you'll have some of your top athletes in the state who also have a big social media influence. If you're a business or a company that's looking at who I want to sponsor my product, you're probably going to want to go for someone who's very popular, but also very good at what they do. But also, there will be some rules, with Wilson adding, athletes should be compensated for their name, image, and likeness. But we're talking about high school athletes, so we want to make sure safeguards are in place. And some of those safeguards include parental consent, the disclosure of all deals, no compensation can offset grants or scholarships, athletes can't enter deals requiring them to promote a sponsor during team activity, they can't promote adult entertainment or alcohol companies, and no school representative can act as an agent for an athlete. And while, you know, some high school athletes across the country have made national deals with huge companies like Nike, Puma, and Gatorade, it's definitely not the norm, at least for now, with the CEO of the National Federation of State High School Association saying, most of the NIL deals that we see happening in high school are like local things, like maybe the local pizza parlor, maybe the local car dealer, and maybe there's like a sign and there's a picture of the kid with the name. But also, we've seen some pushback about these deals. Right when the bill was first introduced in Michigan back in June, the Michigan High School Athletic Association had several concerns and specifically pointed to the difference between college and high school athletics. Saying, so, you know, the colleges are profiting off their athletes by selling jerseys and the like, whereas high schools don't really do that with the MHSAA's executive director saying, the economic model and idea that student athletes are somehow being exploited with this huge money-making operation simply is not the case at the high school level. In fact, some schools have expressed concern that NIL deals may undermine the purpose of high school sports by giving one student paid partnerships that their teammates will never receive. With the Traverse City Central High School Athletic Director Justin Thorington saying, the point isn't to win. The point of high school sports is human development. Development. Developing good citizens, good young men and women that will go on and be more likely to be successful after they've graduated high school because they participated in sports teams. But then you have Representative Wilson arguing that we should be giving these kids the ability to make real money from their likeness, saying by allowing these high school student athletes to earn revenue through their NIL rights, we are giving them power and control over whether or not to capitalize on their own name, image, and likeness in a world that is forever changing, in large part thanks to the internet. And, you know, with all that, my personal opinion as someone that was advocating for, for college athletes to have name, image, likeness rights to be able to profit off of themselves before before it was anywhere near legal. I also support high school athletes being able to do the same. Now that said, because we are largely talking about people that are 18 and younger, yes, we need as many safeguards in place as possible. But in our world, anyone with attention, skill, any and all that, that's being exploited by someone. So I think the first person that should benefit is the actual person, the source of that. And then, you know, the last few days of news coming out of Mexico has been insane. It's doing nothing to shake Mexico's image of being filled with cartel violence after 22 were killed, including a dozen officers in multiple attacks by various cartels. Right, some of the violence was between various drug dealers, such as in the city of Puebla, where five died. However, what really stood out is that some of the biggest attacks were against government officials and convoys. In Michoacan, gunmen killed five while attempting to kill the brother of a local mayor. While that attack did kill and injure many, their intended target was actually just injured. Then there was an attack in Guerrero, where at least 11 police officers and two security chiefs were killed after gunmen fired on their convoy yesterday. But what was especially concerning is that the attack took place in a city that is extremely close to Acapulco, because normally there's this unspoken treaty between the cartels and government to not mess with the tourist areas, but that seems to be going by the wayside. Now, that being said, some respects of the violence aren't surprising, such as the fact that it took place in Michoacan and Guerrero. Both states have long been some of the most dangerous because they are along the lucrative smuggling routes for the cartels and are currently being fought over by various groups as well as the government. When you have multiple cartels fighting over a route, that's when the violence gets turned to 11. But the big picture is that these attacks mean that this year alone, 341 officers have been killed, and they've been added to the more than 420,000 people who have died since Mexico declared its war on drugs in 2006. And that war has clearly not been going well, as since then, the homicide rate has tripled to over 25 per 100,000. Though there is a sliver of hope, as that number is going down, which is great to hear. Though, I mean, for comparison's sake, the U.S. is just 6.3 homicides per 100,000. And the thing is, sadly, it is very likely we're going to see more attacks across the next eight months, as it's common for attacks 
attacks against low-level officials to heavily spike in the lead-up to elections. And then the Trump dominoes keep falling in this Georgia election case. Right? I mean, just last week, we talked about how infamous pro-Trump lawyer Sidney Powell pleaded guilty to six counts of conspiring to interfere in Georgia's elections as part of a plea deal where she also agreed to testify against her other co-defendants, with Powell notably being the first person in Trump's close circle to plead guilty, but also being the second person in the Georgia case overall. And now, it's been less than a week since Powell's plea, and we've already seen not one, but two other people plead guilty in the case. On Friday, we had former Trump campaign lawyer Kenneth Chesbro also pleading guilty for his efforts to overturn the election in Georgia, with Kenny Boy initially being charged with seven felonies, but reaching a last-minute plea deal where he only admitted to one count of conspiracy to commit filing false documents. And his deal was very similar to Powell's, right? Probation, fines, etc. But again, arguably the most important part here is that, like Powell, he also agreed to testify against his fellow defendants. And again, he is just one of two new updates, because this morning we saw Jenna Ellis, a former Trump legal advisor who spread his false election claims, pleading guilty to one felony count of aiding and abetting false statements and writings. Right, prosecutors claim that in addition to her public appearances touting Trump's lies, Ellis also worked closely with Giuliani, traveling around the country to battleground states where she pressured politicians to overturn the elections in their states to favor Trump, and that including Georgia, where she specifically was accused of aiding and abetting Giuliani and another defendant who provided false claims and election fraud to the Georgia legislators to get them to subvert the election. Now, Ellis was initially charged with two felony counts of violating Georgia's Racketeering Act and soliciting the violation of oath by a public officer, but her plea deal today was part of a deal to let her off easier, meaning no jail time because under the plea deal she's serving five years of probation, 100 hours of community service, fines, and an apology. Though again, she will also testify against the other defendants. Right, so very similar to the other deals, but also unlike those people who have reached those agreements, Ellis has actually owned up to her actions, with the Washington Post reporting that her plea marks the first time a senior Trump aide has been held criminally accountable for and has admitted to making false statements that the 2020 presidential election was tainted by widespread fraud. And in tearful remarks to the court today after accepting her plea deal, Ellis actually seemed to hold herself accountable, admitting that she was wrong and no longer believes the false claims that she spread. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this full experience with deep remorse. So big updates, but of course, the, the big question still remains. Will any of this help implicate Donald Trump himself? And then now, another way that we've been trying to spend quality time with our kids has been with cooking. But with hectic schedules, that can be a real challenge. So I want to say thank you to HelloFresh, not only for being a fantastic sponsor, but also for being an easy way to teach our kids how to cook. And with over 40 recipes to choose from every week, HelloFresh provides in-season ingredients delivered right to your door, pre-portioned and ready to cook, along with pictured step-by-step -step recipe cards, which also makes it easy for our boys to get involved with the cooking process, and hopefully that also helps them later in life with the whole adulting thing. You know, I love that HelloFresh takes care of the meal planning, so whipping up that homemade meal is a cinch. Seriously, their quick and easy meals take like 15 minutes, and it's less expensive than takeout. And, oh, you gotta try the fall desserts, like the apple cider cake with caramel sauce and the mini pumpkin cheesecake. <laughs> so good. Though also, I should note, they are seasonal, meaning that they're only available for a limited time, so you need to act now. Also, I'll say their pulled pork nachos not only made it seem like I spent a lot more time in the kitchen than I did for our Sunday football gatherings, but also crowd play are so good, but main thing, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 DeFranco and use code 50 DeFranco for 50% off plus free shipping. Yes, really, HelloFresh.com slash 50 DeFranco and code 50 DeFranco gets you 50% off plus free shipping. It is honestly a no-brainer. So try America's number one meal kit today. And then we need to talk about the killers of the flower moon because the reaction to this movie has raised a lot of questions about how films and art in general should be made. Because if you haven't heard, it is a colossal epic. It stretches almost three and a half hours long, a good bit more than Oppenheimer. With it directed by Martin Scorsese, the guy, of course, did Taxi Driver, Rage, Bowl, Goodfellas Casino, The Departed, The Wolf of Wall Street, and many other classics. And it follows a string of murders in the Osage Nation, an indigenous tribe in Oklahoma, just after oil was discovered on its land in the 1920s. And at the center of all this, you have a love story between Ernest Burkhardt, a white man played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and Molly, an Osage woman played by Lily Gladstone, an actor who grew up on the Blackfeet Nation Reservation in Montana. You've also got Robert De Niro and Jesse Plemons also being cast as Ernest's uncle and an FBI agent. And before we keep going here, I, I do need to warn you that there are spoilers coming. So if you want to avoid it, I need you to skip this story, at least for now and then maybe come back. But that's also because we're talking about real historical events here, and the conversation has to do with the film's plot. So let's dive into it. Starting with who else but Christopher Columbus, the man who kicked off a genocide of tens of millions of indigenous people across the Americas after 1492. So by the 1870s, there were only several hundred thousand left in the United States, and the Osage Nation in particular had been forced off its home in Kansas by the federal government. And so instead of their homeland, they were given some land in Oklahoma that was thought to be worthless, right? Dry desert. But right under their feet was one of the largest oil reserves in the entire country. And the discovery of it in the 1890s literally made them the 
the richest people per capita in the world. So these 2,000 indigenous people receiving money from prospectors for leases and royalties that would be well worth over $400 million today. And they made the most of it, living like well-off white people at the time with mansions, servants, and luxury chauffeured cars. But you had white people wanting in on this gold rush, and since the rights to the oil could only be inherited, not sold, they began marrying into the tribe with sinister motives. And then, surprise, surprise, dozens of Osage people started disappearing in the 1920s, one by one, in what would be dubbed the Reign of Terror. They were shot, bombed, poisoned. One guy even got thrown off a speeding train. With DiCaprio's character, Ernest, who was a real person, taking part in a conspiracy to murder his own wife, Molly's Osage family, for their oil wealth. And you have David Gran, the author of the 2017 book, Killers of the Flower Moon, which the film adapted, explaining. There was a particular diabolical nature to these murder plots because they involve people marrying into families pretending to love you while simultaneously plotting to kill you. But hanging over the entire film is one very heavy question. How much of that love was actually pretend, right? Ernest is portrayed as having genuinely fallen in love with Molly, with whom he had three kids. In the end, he confesses to his crimes and testifies against his own uncle who masterminded the murder plot, and they both go to prison. With Molly divorcing her husband as soon as she learned the truth, then dying in 1937, while Ernest was eventually pardoned and lived until 1986. But some critics of this can't stomach the idea that he really loved her. For example, Christopher Coton, Osage language consultant on the film, told The Hollywood Reporter after seeing the final cut for the first time. And they kind of give him this conscience, and they kind of depict that there's love Love, but when somebody conspires to murder your entire family, uh, that's not love. That's not love. That's that's just beyond that's just beyond abuse. But for Scorsese, that love is the beating heart of the film. Well, the story is most obviously an allegory for the trust and betrayal experienced repeatedly by indigenous people throughout American history. It's also the particular story of one tribe and one woman, Molly, whose loss is so insidious precisely because the love is as real as the betrayal that followed it. And as Scorsese argues, that horrifying truth points to something universal about how we so often hurt the ones that we love. What happened when I went to Oklahoma is that people got up and explained, listen, one thing you have to remember, Molly and Ernest were in love. And this is a mystery of being a human being. How could two people really love each other and fall into such a situation where maybe, for the most part, he really is contributing to her death? Also, you have Molly and Ernest's granddaughter, who's still alive, saying she believes that in spite of everything, he really did love her. But it's also completely understandable that many indigenous people are so often suspicious of a film industry that has long portrayed them in racist or ignorant ways. Right, and recently you have people saying, you know, you have a slate of legendary directors that have tackled stories that relate to the plight of indigenous people in different ways, and they say that those fell short. Right? For example, you have Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, widely acclaimed. But you also have critics pointing out that they barely ever mention the indigenous tribes that were poisoned by nuclear tests in Nevada and suffered cancer for generations. Then you have people who've criticized James Cameron's Avatar movies, which is focused focused on fictional indigenous people, but critics accuse them of being a white savior narrative. Now you have Killers of the Flower Moon, which arguably inverts that trope, so it's more of a white betrayer narrative. And while the film's been widely applauded for doing just that because it resonates more with the historical memory of actual indigenous people, some critics argue that whether the white protagonist is a hero or a villain, the story is still centered around a white guy, which actually brings us to the second big critique of the film given by the Osage language consultant. As an Osage, I really wanted this to be from the perspective of Molly and what her family experienced, but I think it would take an Osage to do that. Martin Scorsese not being Osage, I think he did a great job representing our people. But this story is being told, this history is being told almost from, from the perspective of um, Ernest Burkhart. You also had another language consultant, Janice Carpenter adding. We have so many of our tribal people that are in the movie that it's, it's uh, wonderful to see them. Uh, but then there are some things that were pretty hard to take. And with that, you have people saying in his defense, Scorsese says he deliberately employed as many Osage people on the project as possible, both in the cast and crew. I'm also saying he extensively consulted with members of the Osage Nation to make sure the film was as honest, as accurate, and as respectful as he could make it. It was even shot on location where the actual murders took place in the 1920s. And all of that is actually why you had the Osage Nation's chief, Standing Bear, declaring at the film festival, I can say on behalf of the Osage Nation that Scorsese and his team have restored trust. And also in all of this, you have people having other conversations, right? People saying, ideally, you just let members of marginalized groups direct their own stories. So with that, you have people saying, you know, they wouldn't have the access to all the resources that established filmmakers do. Arguing that a movie like this doesn't get made unless you have Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio to justify a $200 million budget. But also, I will say there, even with the name recognition of Scorsese, DiCaprio, and De Niro, this movie is actually expected to have a tough time at the box office. So it enjoyed a relatively strong opening weekend, raking in $23 million domestically and another $21 million abroad. But there is a hope among the film's supporters that the good reviews in Scorsese's record 
record of performing better as time unfolds will get it over the hump. But with all that said, especially if you have already seen the movie, I'd really love to know your thoughts here. And then let's talk about Yesterday Today, where we take a look back at yesterday's show, where we covered a lot of news. We dive into those comments and see what were your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences. And there, I definitely saw a number of people sounding off on the mess in the House of Representatives. People saying, I love that the GOP is so fractured that they can't agree on who the next person that will do nothing for the American people will be. People adding that the Republican Party has been splintering for some time and everything with the House Speaker just goes to show how hamstrung we are by our two-party system. The regarding conversation about Republicans in the comments, a lot of it was focused on them wanting to kick out students who are here on student visas for speaking in support of Palestine. People sharing the threat to international students just shows how free speech isn't really free speech for all. And adding, I'm an immigrant who lived here since a toddler and becoming a citizen is a lot of work, but the amount of times I've been threatened with deportation during the process is crazy. As well as people saying, not shocking seeing GOP go for free speech, but just for me. Also, and I mean this in a positive way, I saw some people leaving short essays regarding the pharmacy closure situation. People sharing things like, thanks for bringing the pharmacy closure issue to light. As a pharmacist and board member of State Pharmacist Association in a rural state, we are seeing the worst of it, especially in our rural communities with our independent pharmacies. And noting, these independents can act as part of the lifeblood for rural communities as they are the only healthcare providers easily accessible in the area. But then going on to say, these closures are really due to the business practices of pharmacy benefit manager PBMs, the middlemen who negotiate contracts with insurances, manufacturers, and pharmacy buying groups, saying they implement predatory clawback practices for reimbursement, causing pharmacies to lose money on most prescriptions. And writing, this practice is always retroactive, so pharmacies have no idea how much money they are losing until three months after the script is out the door and filled three times. And also, if you want to read the rest of the comment with all the points, you can pause the video right here. But also, I'm glad that the coverage was actually helpful for some people. With some saying, this saved me so much trouble. I'm out of state and had to transfer my prescription to another pharmacy. Didn't check if they covered my insurance like a dummy, then heard in this news story that a lot of insurances dropped covering CVS and mine was one of them. I would have had to transfer again when I needed my meds soon. Saved me a lot of time and energy. Thank you. And then finally, uh, there were a lot of comments about the road rage guy, but most of those kind of boil down to fuck that asshole. And wow, what a crazy asshole. Which yeah, and that is where your daily dive into the news is going to end. But for more news you need to know and watch right now, I got you covered right here. You can click or tap to watch or I got links in the description. And of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you right back here for more news tomorrow.